Good afternoon, it's Monday the 13th of March 2017, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host Brian Gerrish, with me in the studio, Mike Robinson. Uh, well, a word on the weather, spring I think has finally sprung, so the daffodils are all out here in Devon and it's not too bad today. Okay, well, um, doesn't look like Chris Bryant's going to get his underpants, Brian. No, it was a shame because we spent £12.50 on a super bumper pack of uh, three gentlemen's white wife fronts. And that was the promise that uh, if Chris Bryant could produce the evidence that Russia had hacked into elections, uh, we would be delighted to give him not one pair of Y fronts, but indeed three in that bumper pack. But the pack is safe. Uh, the pack is safe because uh, Boris Johnson at the weekend said uh, we have no evidence that Russia is actually involved, involved in trying to undermine our democratic process. Uh, but what we do have is plenty of evidence that Russians are capable of doing that. Um, well, um, yesterday, I believe, um, Alex Thompson, our own Alex Thompson, uh, was uh, on Russia Today uh, discussing this very point. Um, so we thought we would uh, let you see that. Now let's discuss this further and cross live to Alexander Thompson, a former British intelligence officer who now writes for the UK Column News. Welcome to the programme, Alexander. Um, no evidence, that's what Boris has come out and said, but it's still uh, <laughs> guilty of being accused, isn't it? Is it yes, enough? Uh, Is it substantial uh, enough to make such accusations? I think nerve is, is the right word. I mean, uh, Mr. Johnson has form in this regard. I served under four foreign secretaries in the last decade, and uh, although I wasn't happy with any of them in their Russia approach, they certainly would not have gone out and uh, uh, accused the Russians so boldly. But Mr. Johnson has done this across the board, of course. Recently, he was at the European Council and said, uh, we are going to be doing a bit of Libya. Just this past week, he has said that uh, there will be a sort of two-state solution for Israel-Palestine. So. Um, accuracy in his words, which is of course a sine qua non of a foreign secretary, is not his forte. I mean, having the potential to be able to do something, but actually doing it, they're two very different things, aren't they? Uh, Russia's been accused numerous times in the, you know, by the UK, obviously Germany, France, and there seems to be a trend of, uh, of accusing Russia, despite the fact that the evidence is lacking. Why do you think this is? I think it's because the uh, foreign policy establishment in the UK and US is assuming that it still has the total control over the thinking of its domestic population and perhaps a large slice of the rest of the world as well, whereas it isn't. Uh, we, for example, in our small way at UK Column, uh, cover how BBC uh, media action and for some, to some extent BBC monitoring do uh, with evidence precisely uh, the things which the Russians are accused of. Uh, I think that the, the British and Americans are used to uh, making accusations stick simply by their own gravitas. But if you look at uh, ukcolumn.org slash media, for example, you will see us going into chapter on verse on, on how we shape uh, hearts and minds through docudramas and, and something quite quite perilously close to election shaping in uh, that whole belt of countries. Uh, the, the evidence that the Russians do it to us is not forthcoming. Yes, uh, capabilities are there all right, but actually to do it would be an act of aggression. I think that's the key point, and NATO is making noises about this. If it really wants uh, election interference to be regarded as an act of aggression suitable for triggering Article 5 commitments in NATO, then they jolly well ought to come out and, and present the evidence to the public now, because uh, what they're accusing the Russians of is effectively an, an act of war. Well, uh, very strong words you're using there, Alexander, and uh, you know some will perceive it in exactly that way. But how likely are these accusations um, to stop? I don't think that they're likely to stop at the moment because the pe people making them you could call infiltrants within the British establishment and, and former and I think serving officers uh, in our intelligence agencies and in our military are, are quite disgusted about what's going on. Uh, you can see the same, for example, with how General Philip Breedlove in the United States uh, accuses Russia and some Middle Eastern countries of weaponizing the immigration crisis, whereas it's Peter Sutherland, uh, the notorious globalist, who is doing very much that and in his own words has said uh, that uh, it, the EU must undermine 
uh, national, national homogeneity and nation states. The same with this, uh, this uh, accusation or this round of accusations about electoral tampering. If you look at the individuals who are doing it, for example, Mr. Bryant, who's a Church of England reverend and uh, in fact uh, has been the past London director of a political charity called Common Purpose, well, he stands to gain a lot through his organizations. Common Purpose has already received EU funding uh, to rebuild Libya uh, after it was destroyed through much the same kind of accusations from the West of uh, undermining the, uh, the West and, and, and national sovereignty. So uh, if Russia ever were, uh, perish the thought, invaded or, 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 or some kind of hot conflicts uh, uh, proceeded out of all this, the individuals in the institutions in the West making these accusations would stand to gain a lot through the NGOs that they also sit in. Well, very interesting to have your thoughts on this. Alexander Thompson, former British intelligence officer, now writer for UK Column News. Thanks for having us on the programme. Thank you. Well, pretty excellent um, clip, Mike. And of course, um, Alex has come, has hit, uh, hit the key spots there because um, who is actually driving this onslaught against Russia? Well, we know it's politicians with axes to grind. They're pro-EU. The EU says that if there can be conflict, at least between Putin and Trump, uh, that this is good for building the European empire. So we know that there's a military reason for the attack on, Ru on uh, Russia, the hacking attack at the moment. Uh, but of course, there's all sorts of other trade deals in the background. People can make money out of war. So I think it was really good to see that uh, Alex was being very forthright in his comments about what's driving this. So let's, re let's remind viewers and listeners that uh, this was our challenge to Rhonda MP uh, Chris Bryant. Um, what did he have to say? Well, he'd come out and said this. There is clear evidence of Russian direct corrupt involvement in elections in France, in Germany and in the USA. So we challenged him 21 days ago, is that right? I think 22nd of February. Uh, and we said, I bet you a new pair of Y fronts, you can't produce any evidence. And uh, what's happened, no evidence at all. So we can now say that uh, we've got British MPs uh, spreading fake news. Do you think this is ignorance or is this a willful lie, Mike, in order to cause trouble with the Russians? Well, my personal opinion is it's a willful lie. Yeah. But you know. But it's up to people to uh, challenge these politicians. If anybody's listening from uh, Wales and wants to get on the telephone to uh, Chris Bryant's constituency office, perhaps they would like to do that to ask uh, for his comments in light of the fact that Boris Johnson has now been finally cornered and had to admit there is no evidence to support uh, what Chris Bryant and other MPs and, of course, the BBC have been complaint uh, have been um, uh, Promulgating. So essentially, we're, we're watching British propaganda coming out from a number of sources to attack the, Ru the Russians. So bring in the BBC and uh, what better person than Andrew Neil? And uh, I'm going to say this is credit to Guido Fawkes, who had this uh, little video interview up on his website. Uh, he was uh, mocking Andrew Neil for being very aggressive and he was also mocking Louise Mensch. But we're going to focus on Andrew Neil here. He was very aggressive. He was over talking Louise Mensch. And his main point was uh, that if you want to be a journalist, beliefs have to be backed up by some evidence. So that was what a very aggressive Andrew Neil BBC presenter was saying. If you want to be a journalist, beliefs have to be backed up by some evidence. Uh, so if we just bring this in here, uh, we've got the BBC News article, can US elections uh, hack be tracked to Russia? They quote Cozy Bear and uh, Fancy Bear. These are obviously important sources of in information. But down at the bottom, let's bring in the main man. They quote uh, Sean Henry. Now, this is, this is uh, a man who's considered an expert in uh, uh, um, cyber security from CrowdStrike. And this was his quote, we did attribution back to the Russian government. We believed with a high level of confidence that it was tied to Russia. So the BBC uses a quote from a man who says, well, he's worked for the FBI for 24 years in cyber security. But what does Sean Henry say? We believe, does he provide any evidence? No. None at all. Um, so 
So I'm just going to say, Andrew Neil, we tweeted out before the program that uh, we were going to be speaking about him. I hope he's watching uh, because he's working for an organisation that simply doesn't believe in evidence. It simply pumps out beliefs as if this was the truth. Mm. Hypocrisy uh, beyond belief. So let's remind our viewers and listeners of another example here. We mentioned this a few days ago. This was BBC trending. Uh, they were blaming the hacking of UKIP um, cyber communications on the Russians. Uh, lots of words, lots of detail, but when you get into it, no real substance. But this was the bit that we were most interested in. Where does the evidence track back to? Well, according to the BBC, the network was initially uncovered by Alex King, an independent researcher who tweets as Glasnost gone. King tracks Russian propaganda on social media and was an organisation of the campaign to free a Ukrainian pilot who was captured, uh, captured by pro-Russian forces battling in Ukraine in 2014. So um, here's Andrew Neil, and in this second example, BBC evidence, there is no evidence, no Mike, evidence. none at all. So we're going to say, Andrew Neil, uh, you are working for a completely corrupt organisation, the BBC, and you're getting aggressive with Louise Mint when she's uh, doing exactly what your organisation is doing. Mm. Now, interestingly enough, as we'll see in a minute, he was picked up on this, but uh, this is um, Glasnost gone. And um, what can we say on this article? hypocrisy in action and uh, if you want to have a look at his website uh, we were interested with this when somebody said that uh, they watched the interview with Louise Mench and the way that he treated her was an attempt to belittle her and elevate himself which I think is a reasonable criticism uh, look at the reply bollocks and blocked and by this is unbelievable arrogance by this man and if you feel upset about it, don't sit there and think about it. Take some reasonable action, tweet back, email him, phone the BBC, uh, but make sure that people you know, know that something's been happening here. Yeah. So uh, should we introduce one more? Probably, let's go back to the subject of uh, chemical weapons in Syria. And of course, Assad was being blamed uh, for the use of uh, chemical weapons. We had local MPs here, Gary Streeter, Oliver Colville, all saying that uh, given the intelligence, uh, military action was justified. Uh, but in fact, there was no evidence. Uh, this was another Tory MP, Brooks Newmark. He boasted a meeting with General Idris and President Saba. Uh, and he said that uh, basically there was evidence that Assad had used chemical weapons. Uh, we challenged him personally we researched all of the documentation available from the UN, from Portland down, from the, the British government. There was no direct evidence that Assad had used chemical weapons. But of course, that again was the story that the BBC told. And of course, the other story that the BBC has been telling is uh, um, how Assad has been uh, killing uh, civilians in Syria. Um, but uh, we never do that, Brian. But in fact, uh, we've done that once again. Uh, this is uh, 22 civilians killed uh, in Syria yesterday. Uh, number of children, uh, six children under the age of six, four women included in this uh, in this latest uh, number of people, 17 people killed and 22, uh, well, another tranche injured as well. So uh, this is all about the battle for Raqqa, of course. And as we mentioned last week, uh, there is a race on uh, to get to Raqqa first between um, the US-backed, so-called backed coalition um, and uh, the Syrian troops themselves, uh, because as we mentioned last week, uh, the United States wants to get control of that area. They want to um, build an airbase there. Uh, there's a very good video clip of an interview with President Assad, which I watched over the weekend, where he's asked about American troops coming into Syria, and he simply says, uh, we haven't asked for them, they don't have permission. So this is an American invasion, which of course it is. Uh, but we need to remember, of course, that the UK government, without any debate whatsoever in Parliament, inserted British special forces into Syria, which was also a British invasion. So this is the state we're in that uh, the UK and US government simply decide which 
uh, overseas governments they like or don't like. And if you fall into the don't like camp, uh, then we are going to invade you in order to introduce democracy. Yes. It's a great system. Great right? system, absolutely. Um, well, happy Commonwealth Day. Today is Commonwealth Day, so this is great. Now, the Commonwealth, as we've mentioned uh, recently, is made up of 52 member states, six continents, uh, 2.4 billion people. Uh, and, uh, well, this is Commonwealth Day. And to support that, uh, there are a 1,000 individual flag-flying ceremonies. Um, so here is the uh, fly a flag for the Commonwealth uh, on the, uh, the Guildhall in London for the City of London because they want to promote the Commonwealth. Um, and, uh, well, what has Theresa May been doing? Well, she is launching, or today has announced, the Commonwealth Summit 2018. Um, that is going to take place uh, in April next year, uh, while Britain is the uh, chair of, of that. Uh, Theresa May is saying that, well, she and the Cabinet will oversee preparations to ensure that this summit is a truly cross-government effort, including th uh, through a new dedicated inter-ministerial group which is going to be coordinated by Boris Johnson and also by Amber Rudd. Um, so this central team uh, has also been established in the Cabinet Office, sorry, a central team has been established in the Cabinet Office to deliver this summit and is going to work closely with the Commonwealth Secretariat uh, and Member States. Uh, and uh, that dedicated unit is going to report to the Prime Minister. So this is all really good stuff. Uh, during this summit, uh, they're going to going to be various meetings that are going to take place, including meetings at Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle. Uh, and the Foreign Secretary and the Home Secretary are going to lead this new group. Uh, now, of course, leaders from 50 countries are expected to attend that summit. Uh, and uh, well, let's not forget what goes on at Windsor Castle, because, of course, the Windsor Leadership Trust established there by, the, uh, by Prince Philip. Uh, and uh, also the Commonwealth Study Conferences, uh, both of these organisations linked to common purpose, and this, I think, is the key point about the Commonwealth. It is a multinational organisation, global globalist organisation, um, with the common purpose leadership training embedded, right, in embedded it. within it. So this actually makes the Commonwealth much more significant uh, than even the European Union. So what did Theresa May have to say? She said, as we look to create a totally a truly global Britain, the deep partnerships that we share through a 21st century Commonwealth can help us strengthen the prosperity and security of our own citizens. So that sounds very nice. Um, well, the Queen is giving a, a talk today on this because, of course, it's Commonwealth Day. She's the head of the Commonwealth. She has to make a speech. And she's saying, by upholding justice and the rule of law and by striving for societies that are fair and offer opportunities for all, we can overcome division and find reconciliation. It's all words, Mike. It's it's all words. But these are these are important words because, of course, the Queen has done nothing to uphold the rule of law in this country. She's done nothing to make sure that uh, uh, legislation through Parliament, which um, breaches the rule of law, um, doesn't get royal assent. She's done nothing to do that. She's broken her coronation oath on many occasions. She's uh, taken mediatisation. So she's uh, accepted the glory, but given away the power. Absolutely. So uh, so she's broken her, her uh, oath of office, um, but that's OK because she's going to strive for the rule of law. I'm not quite sure how that works. Uh, well, Pat Patricia Scotland, of course, uh, Secretary General of the Commonwealth, she had uh, something to say about this as well. By linking governments and institutions, both public and private, Commonwealth gatherings and networks lay foundations of respect and understanding that enable lasting peace to be built. So this all sounds good, but the key points here are we're going to link governments and institutions, both private and public, uh, and we're going to uh, have many, many networks which are going to lay certain foundations. And we're going to look at uh, part of this uh, linking of governments and uh, institutions, particularly private uh, companies, a little bit later in the news with respect to children. Right, OK. So this is what the Commonwealth is about. It's not about... Uh, a peace-building Commonwealth, which is what they're talking about. Um, well, Pretty Patel um, was saying something as well, but of course this was last week because we mentioned that the inaugural Commonwealth Trade Ministers meeting took place last week, and this is the other aspect of this, which is so insidious. Uh, we mentioned that uh, Liam Fox was speaking at that. She also spoke, uh, and she said uh, that, well, that people had heard in the morning from the Secretary of State for International Trade, Liam Fox, that this is a historic 
a time of historic change for Britain. Our Prime Minister could not have been clearer. It's time for Britain to rediscover our place as the champions of global trade. Uh, we must stand tall in the world as the brightest beacon for free trade and liberal markets. Promoting trade, free markets, private enterprise and liberal economies are the most powerful way we can break the cycle of debt and dependency uh, and put countries on the path to long-term economic growth. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was uh, British-style free markets uh, and British-style liberal economics, which caused debt and dependency, particularly in third world countries, many of whom are members of the Commonwealth in the first place. So the, the hypocrisy here is unbelievable. Um, and uh, she, she, says, she said that the Commonwealth is an exemplar of this potential. She said that development, development must be and will continue to be at the heart of the UK's approach to international trade. Well, if that's true, then this is going to be a unique uh, change in direction policy direction because of course uh, what Britain has done over the centuries has been to prevent the development particularly in the third world while we busy, busily hoover up their natural resources. Uh, anyway she went on to say trade is not a zero-sum game. Trade between nations creates jobs, prosperity and strong economies and of course that's absolutely true uh, and she said that uh, through the crucial institution of the Commonwealth we can and must work together to build a better, more prosperous and stable world for all. Well, I don't think that's at the heart of Priti Patel's uh, policy because, of course, it's her Department for International Development which funded the White Helmets to subvert uh, Syria and is doing the same in many other countries in the world. And then it's the same Priti Patel that says, oh my goodness, we've suddenly got humanitarian disasters taking place in all these countries. We've got to pump in more soft power money and NGO money in order to solve uh, the, the problems that we created in the first place. It is such a fantastic business model if that's the sort of thing that turns you on. It clearly is in her case. Well, today um, the, uh, the ambassador for China in the UK has written in the Telegraph saying Britain can be a key partner in China's new Silk Road. Uh, he said more than, for more than 2,000 years the Silk Road has borne witness to exchange and friendship between the East and West. Uh, with its tales of trade and travel down the ages, the route has... Uh, traditions that have become a source of inspiration for those who seek new opportunities. Uh, now China is looking to work with Britain in a new partnership on a new Silk Road for today, the Belt and Road Initiative. The remarkable opportunities for Belt and Road cooperation are now up for grabs with China. Britain can be a key partner, reaping the potential for these opportunities by ensuring we pull together the Belt and Road Initiative can, like the Silk Road before it, go a long way to delivering better lives for millions of people from Asia and Europe. And of course, uh, that's what China is already doing for many people uh, with the Belt and Rose Initiative. So this offer has been made, uh, but Britain is already making it clear that it, this is not the direction it intends to travel. Uh, the ambassador said in his, uh, in his article that, uh, of course, Britain has put £40 million into the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, but this is nothing. This is a non-amount. Uh, they've given more money to the White Helmets uh, over the last few years. So uh, if we look at what Britain's doing, they're trying to lock down global trade through the Commonwealth. This is clearly the direction they've decided to take since Theresa May became Prime Minister. Uh, Britain is in direct opposition to the Belt and Road Initiative. And China, I think, would be well advised to treat any attempt to get close to Britain with extreme caution because, of course, Britain has demonstrated a capability to, to destroy such initiatives from the inside in the past. Uh, certainly has. Um, it's fascinating how today's news has come together because uh, as we've often said we don't sort of specifically plan the news we follow through on information that comes to us and then we assemble it uh, but uh, let's uh, go through this theme as to what's actually happening in this country are we being governed by a government or is somebody else governing us have a look at uh, this speech from last year by the first sea lord admiral sir philip jones um, he was talking um, in the city of london at mansion house july 2016. Uh, now there's quite a lot uh, to the text here but i think it's important so stay with us as we take you through it so the first quote we found of interest at the weekend the new foreign secretary wrote of his desire for a truly global britain using our unique voice humane compassionate principled to do good around the world and to exploit, 
exploit growth in markets to the full. So this is uh, the Britain that uh, has been uh, smashing Afghanistan to pieces, Iraq to pieces, Libya, uh, Syria, Yemen, uh, just to name a few. Um, but this is, this is our compassionate principled policy, Mike, but not to worry because we're doing it to quote, exploit growth. Yes. So here, it, here is the first sea lord talking to the city of London. He's talking directly to the powerful corporate interests. And I'm going to say, or ask our viewers and listeners, is he actually talking to the government of UK? Let's follow it through. Um, this is a little bit more of what he says. So the hard punch of military power is often delivered inside the kid glove of humanitarian relief or the mailed fist of maritime security. But the Royal Navy also delivers the soft touch of engagement, that reassuring and persistent UK presence in the world that underpins the friendships and commitments upon which so many economic partnerships rest. So he is prepared to say publicly that uh, Britain is using military power inside the kid glove of humanitarian aid right. this is a pretty cynical statement mike but but this is the this is a really important point because how many times have we heard people brian um questioning why britain spent so much money on foreign aid and they're saying we shouldn't be spending all this money overseas when we could use the money at home billions of pounds going in through pretty patel's department into foreign aid and that's the reason why yeah so this is, as somebody said in our chat box, this is actually subversion at work. And we got the first Sea Lord, Admiral Sir Philip Jones, happy to be talking about, happy to be talking to profit-making corporations, global companies, about how his Royal Navy is there to help them uh, make more profit. Yeah. Okay, well, let's go on through it. Uh, many of our closest diplomatic and military to die T sorry, military ties today were forged on the parade ground 30 or 40 years ago. Britannia Royal Navy College has trained the current heads of two dozen navies. Over the past 10 years, the Royal Navy's flag officer sea training and his staff have trained 105 of the world's navies and coast guards, 58 of them in 2015. Across the board, the message from our friends in NATO, the Commonwealth, the Gulf and beyond is clear. They want more of the Royal Navy. So this is a first sea lord who is presiding over a fleet that simply can't do the job. We haven't got aircraft carriers in service. We've got major problems with nuclear submarines. We have no maritime patrol aircraft. We have no surface to surface missiles. We're shortly to uh, lose helicopter launch air to surface missiles we've got immense problems with manning particularly with uh, highly experienced uh, non-commissioned officers and he says well we're out there worldwide doing the job clearly the job he's talking about mike is not to do with warships at sea this is to do with something else this is to do with training other countries military uh, presumably so we can then control them mm. uh, follow on through the speech uh, from the earliest days of uh, exploration uh, to the height of empire and beyond the royal navy has always been the guardian of maritime trade long before trafalgar the teenager ratio nelson was protecting the ships of the british east india company it was naval power that opened china and japan to western markets so he's boasting of the fact that uh, military force was used to open those markets to the detriment of the of the countries concerned. Mm -hmm. um, interesting for the first sea lord to be talking about this, uh, how he can help uh, create greater profits for these corporations, not how he can run the, the Royal Navy in order to defend Britain as a nation state. And uh, we'll go into the grey zone here. Um, he says our historic relationship with the city of London is testament to this. 350 years ago, the city's wealthiest citizens raised £16,000, not an insignificant sum back then, to fund the construction of a new warship. The king, so taken with his display of patriotism, named her Loyal London. But those 17th century Londoners weren't motivated by loyalty or patriotism alone. They were merchants and traders. They knew that prosperity and security were intertwined and, quote, 
that a strong, credible Royal Navy was necessary to protect and advance their own commercial interests. So this man's put it on a platter, Mike, that uh, Britain's armed forces are no longer there to defend the nation, uh, to defend uh, the public and defend families. According to the first sea lord, they're there to help City of London merchants make greater profit. And, uh, and this has been the British Empire historically and continues to be? Continues to be. So I think we're becoming pretty clear what's going on. When we have said that child abuse is the engine of British politics, of course, that is the case because that is the means by which very powerful global corporate interests can black, blackmail British politicians to get them to push this agenda for, what is it, the rules-based uh, international order. Thank you, the rules-based international order. Uh, UK column is providing evidence. We're quoting from the actual documents. So unlike the BBC that likes to rely on beliefs, we prefer to rely on the actual evidence of what this gentleman had to say. Um, well, as you mentioned, um, we're not going to have, we have no more missiles um, launched from helicopters by the end of this month. So last week, Brian, uh, the Lynx uh, carried out its final firing of the Sea Skua, short range air to surface missile, anti-ship weapon uh, that was in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, so they were running the last tests of that weapon uh, because it's going to retire at the end of this month with the Lynx because th that weapon doesn't fit the Lynx's successor. Uh, so uh, the Lynx is to say retiring from service at the end of March uh, and the Sea Skua as well. And the replacement is going to be the Sea Venom, uh, but of course made by a French company. Uh, but unfortunately, they're not going to be ready until 2020 at the earliest uh, to be put on the successor to the Lynx, right, this um, is, which this is, 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 is called the Wildcat. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, what can we say? Treason is the word, because um, this, of course, is planned. This is not incompetence in defence procurement. This is absolutely planned. This is... David Cameron's 50-year pact with the French, which was to basically emasculate Britain's armed forces uh, so that the remains could be subsumed into the French and the EU unified military. Uh, so we have um, warships with no surface, surface missiles because Harpoon's going to be withdrawn. Uh, people say, well, not to worry because the helicopters are still going to have very small air-to-surface uh, missiles, and now we know those are going to disappear. Um, what we are watching is Britain's military being deconstructed in a, in a proper sense in order to achieve that EU integration. And let's just add that we started with the attacks on Russia, uh, and we know in, that in documents being peddled by Conservative ME, MEPs, the statement is that we can't possibly have uh, normalised relations with uh, President Trump and President Putin because that would be bad for the EU to build its super state. This is very dangerous stuff. Um, if you want to see, um, get some information about how this EU military unification is going, how it has happened throughout the last couple of decades, um, if you get onto the UK column website and on the right hand, in the right hand column, there's a, a link there that says EU military unification on it. Have a look at that and we have a timeline um, showing uh, all the major steps to date. Uh, we've still got a few more bits and pieces to put in there. For example, uh, uh, German-Dutch uh, integration. integration and also some of the uh, Eastern European states getting involved with the German military. Um, but uh, most of the main parts are there. Uh, go and have a look at it and do share it around uh, because this is a pretty important subject. Um, but it's uh, not all bad news, Brian, because uh, we've spent £100 million pounds uh, in Portsmouth Harbour, and now we have a jetty uh, which is capable um, of taking the new aircraft carrier should, ca carriers should they ever actually end up in service with aircraft. Um, but we now have a jetty that it can moor at. Um, this is brilliant, £100 million. Uh, but as you asked earlier, the question is, have they actually succeeded in dredging the channel yet to allow it to get access to the jetty? Dredging the harbour in order to get these aircraft carriers with no aircraft in alongside. But I, I think that really Theresa May should be boasting about this on a world stage that Britain has um, has been able to build a jetty. Yes. No more to be said on that one. Um, OK, well, we have two new permanent representatives to the EU. You'll be pleased to know uh, these uh, um, 
they're very pleased to be announced. Uh, one is Katrina Williams. Uh, she has been pointed, appointed to the post of UK Deputy Permanent Representative. Uh, and the Deputy Permanent Representative uh, represents the UK on the UK on the Committee of Deputy Representatives and in the Council of the European Union. Uh, and uh, she will be covering social, environmental and economic issues. Uh, her background is that she's been a Director General, G Director General for International Growth in the Department for Business, Energy and Indust Industrial Strategy. Uh, she's also been involved at the Department for Energy and Climate Change. Uh, and before she was there, she was uh, Director General for Strategy, Evidence and Customers in the Department for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. That's good. Uh, and from 2008 to 2012, she was Director General for Food and Farming at DEFRA. And between 2003 and 2006, she was Deputy, he Deputy Head of the European Secre Secretariat of the Cabinet Office. So there you go. She is well qualified for this job. And the other one is a guy called Simon Case. Uh, he is the new, the new Director General for the UK-EU Partnership and he will be leading the government's work on exiting uh, the European Union, apparently. Uh, he was appointed to the Prime Minister's, as the Prime Minister's Principal Secretary in January 2016, um, so he's now left that job. And before that, he was a, a Director of Strategy at GCHQ. Now, I, um, I asked Alex Thompson uh, if he was aware of this guy and he has never heard of him before in his life. So um, Alex not quite sure exactly where he came from when he joined GCHQ. He's maybe there for six months or something, I don't know, but uh, not quite sure what qualifies him. So that's that. Um, and moving on to a completely different subject then. Uh, this is uh, a lady suing the BBC or has sued the BBC for a million pounds uh, over a claim that uh, BBC betrayed her. And effectively, if what she says is true, they absolutely did. So this is Karen Ward. Uh, she was one of the first people to uh, speak out against Jimmy Savile on, as a serial paedophile. Uh, she was abused by him. Uh, she saw other uh, stars of radio and television abusing children uh, while she was with him. Um, and Panorama had been involved with her uh, and they had been encouraging her to speak out. Uh, they recorded some interviews with her where she also named, aside from Billy, uh, Jimmy Savile, she also named Freddie Starr. She had said to the BBC, I do not want you to, to make that allegation public. The BBC went ahead and made the allegation against Freddie Starr public anyway. Uh, and so Freddie Starr sued her uh, for libel. Now, Freddie Starr was then found to have no case to answer uh, in the police investigation. However, he did lose the libel case against Karen Ward, uh, but he then refused to pay uh, the 952,400 pounds legal costs, uh, and uh, despite the fact he had lost, uh, and so she was basically left with her part of the bill. Uh, the BBC says they have now settled this out of court for an undisclosed amount, uh, and they said uh, they have agreed to make a contribution to Ms Ward's legal costs, the BBC and Ms Ward are pleased to, that the matter has been resolved. But at the bottom of this, Brian, is the fact that, uh, that um, they interviewed this lady. She asked for certain uh, caveats on that interview, which they then proceeded to ignore, which is a pretty well, disgusting thing to do. And if we look at the BBC's behaviour over the whole child sexual abuse scandal, um, uh, we could say that they, they, they've made some pretty dubious decisions. Well, uh, they're not. Um, my my opinion, my belief is they're not uh, dubious. These are calculated decisions because, of course, the the BBC is not going to expose child abuse because if it starts doing that, we're going to see the full scale of it, and of course, it's going to run straight to Westminster and the establishment, the very uh, organisations that the BBC serve. So the BBC, uh, British government's propaganda machine. British government, we know, is covering up child abuse. BBC's got to cover up that child abuse. Mm. So did the BBC deliberately try and undermine this lady because of her evidence? I think that could well be the case. Mm. Who knows, because uh, it's all been settled conveniently behind closed doors. Well, let's end on the notes that uh, if you don't know what's happening in education, you need to, uh, because uh, Babcock is another one of the uh, big defence companies that's now moving in to educate our children. Uh, they're setting up local authority partnerships, big education contracts. Our mission, it says here, is to improve outcomes for children and young people, including the most vulnerable and disadvantaged. So 
I get a very uncomfortable feeling with this stuff, Mike, that uh, we're told, uh, don't worry about your children. We've got some nice defence company. It is going to make a bit of profit out of education. Don't worry about that, though, because really we're a multi-million, billion pound company. Uh, thousands of people on the ground, about 4,000 Babcock boasting operating in the southwest alone, if I understand their website correctly. Um, but their only interest is not really money, not really profit or dividends. It's to give your children a good education. Yes. And um, of course, you are going to have a little bit of champagne and a good time. So here's some of the Babcock team and they got an award. Uh, it says Babcock Education, led by Director of Education Services, Amanda Fisher, received a high level of praise from the judges who included James Fothergill, head of education and skills at the CBI and Jack Salter, head of commercial policy at the Department of Education. So this is all backed by the government and uh, they've got the prize for innovative joint ventures with Surrey and Devon County Councils. Um, the quote was an impressive penetration of a difficult local authority sector. So this tells me this company's had to work very hard to get its corporate interests in amongst local authority um, roles and of course what what is a traditional local authority role to provide education for children so income babcock but not to worry because they've delivered savings and results with schools in surrey bringing them up to the standard that they should be achieving and they've continued this good work with other local authorities now we're encouraging people to research this yourself because there's a lot of information on the site uh, here we are, partners in education, um, a little bit of corruption on this website as far as the text goes. Uh, that's, not, uh, that's not anything to do with the image we've created. That's corruption on the website itself, just of the text. Uh, but here we are. What sort of money are we talking about? A 125 million deal with Devon Council. Did anybody vote for this, Mike? I don't know anybody locally that suddenly said, well, relax, because Babcock is taking over education. And then when we get into it, up it comes, mm. thought leadership workshops. And who's running this? Well, we've got a gentleman called Andy, former director of children's services. Sorry, there should be a bit more to it here. Um, so he's uh, worked in London in children's services. And he's also uh, working with Children's Improvement Board. Now, I found this language rather strange because what is it improving? Apparently, it's improving children. Good. And uh, can we have a look at that uh, Children's Improvement Board? Well, here it is. Uh, it's embarking on a program to promote and support the effective use of data. Oh, I, I thought it would be improving children. No. No, apparently not. No, it's going to use data working with regional networks. This will be delivered through highlighting and sharing good practice, practical ways to strengthen council and safeguarding capacity through improved access to good data. So we're not going to do anything about the child abuse, but we are going to work on the data. Uh, you can read some details about uh, CIB. And you'll find it's linked in with this, another very interesting organisation. We can relax because this organisation is also networking authorities and non-government organisations to protect children. There is no child abuse going on. No. Am I? Um, these people come out of the woodwork and claim that they've been abused. Uh, there's thousands of them, but there is no abuse going on. And on it goes because uh, we then come into yet another charity. So we've got something very nasty going on here. We've got the head of the Royal Navy boasting that Britain is going to use humanitarian aid as a cover for pretty ruthless military conduct, but that's all to generate profit. And now we've got the Department for Education, which has opened the door for defence companies to come in and run contracts for your children. I think people in UK need to really understand what's going on. And the question is, did you ever vote for Britain's public services to be privatised in this way? I didn't. I didn't either. That's it. Uh, for, that's the end of today's news. We're at the point where we don't know what else to say. We will just give a reminder that the 22nd of April is the big Nottingham meet for the British Constitution Group. Remember, this is all about providing a very big space 
for people to come together and share the information that they want to share. This is not about set piece talks. So the Albert Hall will take nearly 950 people. If this is full, what a fantastic event it will be. And uh, we can see that people are gonna make friendships and be able to share their experience and information. And we should also mention that uh, because the first of the month was a Wednesday and um, our monthly meeting is always the third Wednesday of the month, uh, that will take place this week, therefore, uh, in two days' time. Indeed. Uh, well, that's it for today. Uh, if you want to research um, material from mainstream media about those nasty Russians, please do. But what we think we're looking at is a massive propaganda exercise by Theresa May's British government. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.